<laughs> you need a diet, Rocky. Not yet, I hope. You wait till you try and walk over these wires. <laughs> okay, so let's go. I'm not quite sure how this is supposed to work, and I don't think Rocky is either, but we'll see how we get along here. So it seems to me that you ask, why do people do science? I think basically all scientists are really curious about how nature works. But different scientists find different aspects of how nature works interesting. For fundamental physicists, they want to understand the basis of matter, of forces, of time. And we have a standard model of fundamental physics, which has six quarks, six leptons, four forces. That's pretty simple, but it's not fundamental enough. You know, there are still things people don't like, a few parameters, the mass of all the particles. So people want to go even deeper. They would like to explain all these things. There's just one object. The whole world is one object, a string with oscillations on it. It needs a few extra dimensions, and it doesn't actually relate to anything we can see, but that would be really fundamental. <laughs> now, there are other people who actually think it's quite interesting to understand how a butterfly flies. It's complicated. Where does the energy come from? Why do they go forwards? How does a monarch butterfly know to get from California to some forest in Mexico. We never went there before. How is the information transmitted? These are interesting questions too. So I think in practice, all of us find both aspects interesting, but in some fields, some are more predominant than others. So high energy physics is the study of the very, very small. Of course, <laughs> To see the very, very small, you do need to spend a lot of money. <laughs> and according to Rocky's article, this thing, which is the Atlas detector, about to switch on soon in Geneva, is uh, built by a team of 1,900 scientists. I didn't check this, but that's what you quoted, so I guess this is the right number. These guys, these physicists, have been working on this for 15 years. They are a team, you know, 1,900 people. You have to organize them like you would an engineering firm to build this thing. And then when it goes, maybe we'll see additional structure beyond this. So this is a, a big thing. It took 1,900 people. They've been organized. They've been working on it for 1,500 years. They're the team. <laughs> They're going to analyze the data. And the rest of you, tough. If you want to see it, you're never going to see the data. So you better believe what they say. This is just as expensive. The Hubble Space Telescope costs more than the Atlas detector, probably comparable to the whole of the LHC. So astronomy ain't cheap. But whereas that was an experiment with a team, this is an observatory. So even though you didn't spend 15 years working on this, if you have a good idea, you can send a proposal to the Space Science Institute, and you may get time to carry out your scientific program on this next year. 
And if you don't think about it, well, you know, all the data is sitting in an archive, so you can actually go and get it and try something out. So this is a different way of doing science. They're just different traditions from different communities. Here is what I would consider another very successful experiment, which is working. This is in space. It's more than an order of magnitude cheaper than the last one, so we're going down, but it's still a few hundred million. It's not that cheap. Here, again, there's a team. They get to specify the program. They get to look at the data. But at least since NASA's running this, you can get to see the data later. So it's an improvement. But it's very much set up in the mold of a physics experiment. They knew what they were looking for. They made their machine to go and look for it as well as possible. And they've done a great job. This has a huge team compared with WMAP. It's about the same price, slightly cheaper maybe. The team there, of course, here was doing all the software to do the Sloan survey. I claim this is an observatory. But the difference from other observatories is that the data processing to make the results public is part of the engineering. So here, you don't even have to propose if you want to use the data. It's all public. You just go and look at it and do your project. So this is, again, a different way of doing science. So if you compare observatories and experiments, I'd say observatories are things that are designed for general tasks. They serve a quite diverse community. Their program is set up through proposals. Or with SDSS, you just go do what you want. There are many teams of all sizes. You can propose to HST as a big team or a small team or as an individual. Many of the results that come up were not anticipated when the thing was put up. It was not designed to get a specific result. It was designed to enhance capabilities. Many of the results were anticipated. And it fosters skills, the kind of skills saying, well, look, this looks like an interesting data. I wonder if this would be interesting to look at x. And as we saw when it broke, this tremendous support as a facility from the public. Typical experiments, on the other hand, are optimized for a single task. More than that, maybe for a, a large collider, but still a relatively narrow range of tasks. They have, serve a very coherent community. In WMAP, it was the team. The program is essentially set at design. And then the main results are a sense of plan. Obviously, they don't know what's going to come out, but they know exactly what they want to do. And so this nourishes analytic and data processing skills. The main problem is how to pull your signal out of the data, which is very difficult. And that's what most of the people on the teams spend a large part of their time doing, is figuring how to get the signal out. And the public impact, which is still very large, of course, is through the results. There's no sort of feeling of public interest in the facility itself, but people are very enthusiastic about what came out. So the two different cultures. So how does this affect dark matter and dark energy? So you've all seen this pi diagram. Butterflies are here. Actually, everything you know anything about is here. And all the rest. So this looks impressive because you made the pi. Because you could, you know, if you go to an atlas, you see different kinds of maps. You have maps where the which are proportional to the area. The usual way you're good, you can make a map which is proportional to the population or the gross income. So if you made this pi according to how much knowledge we have, it would be completely dominated by this section. So it's just because we chose to plot it this way that this, you know, the dark matter and the dark energy looks so impressive. Actually, here we have some ideas. <laughs> some, we have some idea about what the dark matter is. For the dark energy, we haven't a clue. And this, of course, is why people find it so exciting. There's nothing more exciting than something you haven't a clue about. But because you don't have a clue about it, you don't have a clue how to find it. You don't have a clue how to do anything else about it. So when you consider how these different things interact with the rest of physics and astrophysics. Dark matter, there are some fairly well motivated hypotheses of what it might be. It could be an axion. It could be a light supersymmetric particle. It could be something completely different, of course. Rocky liked Wimpzillas. Maybe he'll come back to this. But anyway, there are ideas for what people, what these things could be. And in any case, the dark matter does have an enormous effect on all the rest of astrophysics because it's the dark matter, the gravitation effects, which drive the formation of the things we see. So everything we see is very much affected by what the dark matter is doing. So there's a, a close interaction between the dark matter and all the rest of astrophysics. And also, with the rest of physics, for example, there may be signs of the dark matter coming out of the LHC. And it may be detected in a calorimeter, in a mine. And it may, the annihilation products may even be observed by the next generation of gamma-ray telescopes. So there are many interactions with other parts of astrophysics. 
Dark energy is not as friendly. So we, since we don't know what it is, we haven't a clue how it interacts with the rest of physics. You know, some people say it's just nonlinear effects of, of general relativity. So the physics we have already explains it. We just haven't uh, figured out it, uh, it, uh, it well enough. Actually, Rocky was one of the ones putting this forward. Very few people believe that. That is correct. <laughs> I just wanted to help your credibility. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, another possibility. <laughs> no, I throw off most of my thread of my talk, but anyway. So the, uh, I was supposed to be leaving the jokes to Rocky, but anyway. Um, so other possibilities, it, it could just be a cosmological constant. It could be a modification to the laws of gravity, or it might be some other part of the vacuum. We don't know. And all the models that people have proposed are essentially arbitrary just to, uh, to explain the phenomenon. Maybe this is where you can figure out about those strings I referred to at the beginning. Maybe actually this is the dark energy. This is desperation, of course, because the strings don't interact with the rest of physics and astronomy. Dark energy doesn't appear to arrest, uh, uh, interact with the rest of astronomy. Maybe they interact with each other. <laughs> but in any case, as far as we know for the dark energy, there are basically only two routes for most of the particles people are talking about. Find out more about it. One is to measure very precisely exactly how fast the universe has expanded with time. That's this function A of t. And the other is to find out exactly how fast the individual structures have grown, how the contrast of structures in the universe has amplified with time. In the linear theory, that's what I call g of t here. And these two functions are basically, for most people's ideas, the only things that give us any information about dark energy. And in fact, if, dark, dark, if, if general relativity is correct, you can derive one of these from the other. And so there's only one function in this whole game. Now, we already know this expansion history pretty well. The supernova rate, everything that went into the cosmo co concordance cosmological model, means that we know the expansion history of our universe to better than 10% over a long period of time. So for all the rest of astrophysics, that's good enough. You know, everything else that we don't understand about how structure grows and how individual objects form have much larger uncertainties than the one introduced by the residual uncertainty in this factor. So this means if we spend a lot of money to measure this much more accurately, this may help dark energy, but it's not going to make much difference to what we know about structure formation. The other problem is, since we have to use astronomical objects to measure this expansion rate, all the things that we use, supernovae or clusters, are complicated objects. And we have to measure the result very precisely. So it doesn't need very much uncertainty about the properties of objects to screw us up. So we have a problem that making a very precise measurement of the dark energy may not directly help us with other aspects of astrophysics, but the astrophysics may certainly screw up the measurement of the dark energy at a level which we can't predict in advance because we don't know where the systematic errors are going to come from. So why did I put out a paper saying dark energy was dangerous? This was only intended to be a warning. I think dark energy is very interesting, and I think we should go after it. But as we do it, I think we should be careful how we do it. And I think if we don't do it carefully, the risks that come from collaborating with a community who doesn't structure their work and doesn't view their work in the same way as we do are several. So I list three here. One of the dangers I see is that when you, because Many of the people coming to the physics community were seduced into wanting to work on dark energy, first, because they think it's very interesting, and second, by the great success of microwave background studies. And the important thing about the microwave background studies is they've been able to make very precise results. You can make a six or seven parameter model which fits the data apparently perfectly. So everything is, list, is essentially limited by your statistical errors and your ability to understand your instrument. This, unfortunately, is extremely unusual in astrophysics. I can't think of any other case in astrophysics where this is possible. For example, people for many years have been studying the oscillations of the sun, solar ringing. Those also are weak sound waves propagating now through the sun. They have very precise measurements of the frequencies of many, many modes inside the sun. But they've been prevented from making definitive conclusions of the kind that you can make from WMAP because the sun, even though it's a spherical equilibrium star, is still a complicated system. And the complications of that system 
make the interpretation of the results difficult. And so you cannot take W map as an avatar of what the next experiment is going to be like. You may be limited by things that you can't control. So it's important to take this into account when thinking about the risk. So the question is, what's the, li the likelihood that when we've done a an, an billion dollar experiment, we've only reduced the error bias by a factor of two or three? We may well do better, but it's not insignificant that that would be the result. And the question is, is, is a factor of two or three enough to be worth all this money? The other thing which has been em emphasized to me by theoretical physicists is there's a prior, and do you actually expect any change? I mean, the most dramatic thing about dark energy is the value is 120 orders of magnitude different from what we expected. This is a ridiculous coincidence. We don't understand it. But if this value now changes on a time scale of order of the current age of the universe, that requires a second coincidence. We don't have any theory which suggests this should be true. I mean, actually, we have too many theories, but none of them makes any contact on anything else. So in a sense, the a priori under, uh, there's a, a fairly large a priori Bayesian probability, if you like, that it won't change, that it'll look like a cosmological constant. I don't know if this is 50% or 20%, but if you spend a billion dollars and you have 50% chance of getting an un un uninteresting result, you better be able to do something else as well. So therefore, I think it's important to make sure that your experiment can do other things as well as the dark energy, just to, you know, if, if you get the uninteresting result, you'll have something else to fall back on. And this is the tradition in astrophysics. That's why people make observatories. They push the capabilities, and with new capabilities, if you don't find an interesting result on galaxies, maybe you'll find that you can find out something about extrasolar planets. So you spread the risk. If you can't control your experiment, you should spread the risk if you're going to spend a large amount of money. Insurance companies know all about this. So therefore, when you're designing such a thing, it's dangerous to design it like you would design the Atlas detector for the LHC or even like you would define, design the WMAP satellite. You have to take into account that they should be able to do other things which are useful as well. And so you should be very careful not to eliminate the capability of doing other things besides your primary goal. And in many dark energy experiments, there's a danger of that. Rocky headed a, a, a task force to look into dark energy experiments. They were very careful to say that looking at the other aspects of the problem were critical. And, you know, if people follow their recommendations, that'll be fine. But you have to be very careful when the financial crunch comes and you have to start downsizing to fit your mission price, you don't sacrifice the rest of the science for the primary goal, because you could be left with nothing. The final thing, which for me is the uh, dominant one, and I've ran out of time for my 15 minutes. Well, I'll give you an extra five minutes. Because <laughs> actually, the, this was the reason I wrote the thing, is that I, I think one of the great um, assets of astronomy is the fact that individual researchers can come in and can use the Hubble Space Telescope. That an individual university group can have a good idea and go through something at the forefront of the field. This is no longer possible in high energy, astrophys in high energy physics. If you want to be on the Atlas team, you have to be on the team if you ever want to see data. And you have to be on the team for a long period of time and spend a substantial amount of your working career doing whatever was necessary to build the thing. This is a big difference in culture. I think the reason that astronomy is attractive to creative and ambitious young people is because they can come in as a graduate student and still write a paper as a graduate student that makes a mark. This is much more difficult in a more organized field like high energy physics. I don't think we want to sacrifice that. In addition, I think the reason that astronomy is so attractive to the, to the public is first that it does ad address very fundamental issues like is there life somewhere else? How did the universe begin? Where are we going? But it also has an enormous richness. You can find out about dark energy today and tomorrow you're looking for life on another planet. And then you're seeing black holes accreting huge amounts of gas and then you're seeing neutron stars exploding. This richness is what allows us to keep uh, presenting our science to the public and making it attractive to them. If we focus too strongly on single issues, we can lose this. The LHC sees this. It's very difficult to come back every year for 10 years to say that when we finished this huge thing, we're going to find the origin of mass. People will find this interesting the first time, or maybe the second time, but they need 
breadth. So I think too much focusing on single issues will destroy the attraction of our field for the general public. And that will then undermine our future funding and our future source of young astronomers. So those are the reasons why I think we should be careful not to adopt too much of the procedures from high-energy physics. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you, Robert. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, um, a couple of months ago when uh, we were on a phone conference uh, dis deciding what we do here, uh, since I live and work on the south side of Chicago, I suggested uh, describing this as a smackdown. <laughs> and of course, Simon, who lives in the sophisticated city of Munich, said, what's a smackdown? <laughs> So I thought part of my job here is to educate Simon. <laughs> so I, uh, w one thing I did was to go to the, urban, the online urban dictionary. <laughs> and the, the definition of a smackdown is inflicting of a beatdown of epic proportions upon a jabroni. <laughs> so, so, so you know, now you know what a smackdown is. For those of you not of Italian descent, a jabroni is also a loser, <laughs> opposer, and a lame ass. Now, Simon, of course, since he comes from Cambridge and uh, you know very uh, sophisticated places, suggested the Queensberry rules. <laughs> And I looked those, but I didn't like the idea that no shoes or boots with springs are allowed. <laughs> Since I have springs in my boots, I uh, decided that we wouldn't do it that way. OK, so the question Simon asks, and which uh, motivated this, is dark energy good for astronomy? And uh, I will answer that by saying it's the wrong question, I think. So it's like asking, is dark matter good for astronomy? Is black holes good for astronomy? Exoplanets? I have no idea whether there are peculiar A stars or not, but you know, are peculiar A stars good for astronomy? I don't, I don't really think that's the, uh, the best question to ask. And I'll come back in a moment to uh, reframing the question. Uh, I also think it is a serious error to uh, make artificial distinctions between disciplines. So I, I view our work as astronomers or cosmologists or astrophysicists more generally. So not only do we want to <laughs> not only do we want to see what's out there, but we want to peek through and understand the machinery. So the overarching goal is not to say uh, this is in the universe, but actually how the universe works. And it's not only understanding what's in the universe, the structure, but also the fun how they operate with the laws of nature. And that's why in opening the, um, my uh, response to Simon's paper, I quoted John Muir who said, when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find, found it bound fast by a thousand invisible cords that cannot be broken to everything else in the universe. So um, I, one of the things that motivated me to respond to Simon's paper was the, this division, these walls that he put up between dif different disciplines, and I see it all as a generic uh, whole. So uh, Simon puts up walls, and I would say, Mr. White, tear down that wall. <laughs> So I, I think Simon and I largely agree that uh, the, a better question that really should be asked and the community should be involved in discussing is our community right structured? So astronomy is changing now, and I think astronomy has always been changing. Uh, 
we are in the era of large projects and collaborations. Not all of astronomy is large projects and collaborations, but some of them are. And uh, dark energy is a proxy for large projects and large collaborations. That's why it's very useful to discuss dark energy. And the community should discuss this. And um, I take the point of view that we are in charge of our field. And we can choose wisely or not. So the fear that if we involve too much dark energy, this might happen or this might go wrong, it would be our fault. We have to take ownership of our field. We are in charge of our field. And I think Simon and I largely agree, at least we will agree, if he agrees with me, that, that, the, <laughs> that the real issue is a question of balance. So naturally, we still should have single investigators and small collaborations. I think that's where a lot of the real innovation in astronomy and astrophysics come from, comes from. And we also need large collaborations that have the resources to do large surveys or investigations that require many wavelengths to look at objects or many instruments, many telescopes. And uh, dark energy is a good e example of this. So uh, let me first uh, say just a word about the fact that astronomy is, is changing. It's, so it's not your grandfather's astronomy, or in this case, maybe your great-great-grandfather's astronomy or your grandmother's astronomy. So the image that the public have of astronomers, this is a picture of Hubble at the Hooker Telescope. You know, you have your lunch at the monastery, and then you put on your best suit, and you go and you put your eye to the eyepiece. Astronomy's not done that way, right? I mean, you, you could even have theorists doing astronomy. <laughs> or the, you know, the romance, you put on your bomber jacket and your scarf, and you sit in the prime focus cage of the Palomar Telescope. You know, the lone, lonely astronomer. I don't know why people are astronomers, but that's... Um, <laughs> So, but that's not the, um, that's not the way astronomy is done anymore. And we're sort of in a, in a transition to larger teams and larger projects. I think that's the way the field is going. And the thing that really scares people, and Simon responded to this, is, is this the future of astronomy? Will this be an astronomy collaboration in the future? This is the CDF collaboration, the Collider Detector Facility at Fermilab, and I believe Toronto's a member of CDF, isn't that right? Yes, yes. yes. So, so there's probably some Toronto people here. And, but this is uh, an experiment, <laughs> probably some Toronto <coughs> people in this picture. This is a collaboration of 440 physicists from 35 institutions in five countries. And um, the thing that scares a lot of astronomers, you know, you worry about whether uh, the papers <laughs> that you publish, this is the first page, you know, the author list and the collaboration, you know, the institutions spill off on the second page, and then there's visitors from this. And of course, people are most afraid of this if their name comes toward the end of the alphabet. <laughs> For instance, If your name would be SDM White, you would be author 414. <laughs> so you, you may have to change your name, but even if you're SDM Black, you would still be 45. So you might say, I'm going to be SDM AA White, <laughs> but I'm still only two. <laughs> AA Black would be number one. So this actually scares a lot of people. But it's under our control. We are in charge of our field. Now let me say a word about dark energy and why it's so compelling and why I feel it's an important part of astronomy and we have to get to the bottom of it. This is uh, another pie chart. Simon showed one before. And uh, there's a lot to learn from here. We can learn a lot here. It tells us why chemistry is insignificant. <laughs> right. And of course, dark matter and dark energy. This is the standard L lambda CDM model. 
And uh, this is quite remarkable because on the basis of this model, in principle, you can uh, predict or explain every cosmological observation. So is that the end of the story? You know, is our mission accomplished? <laughs> Should we land on an aircraft carrier and, you know, have a parade and say our mission's accomplished? And uh, just because we have a model that is useful for comparing to observation doesn't mean our job is done. We are not economists. Uh, you know, I just love to uh, make fun of economists whenever I can because the University of Chicago Egonomics Department is so, uh, so well known. <laughs> but there, is, uh, there was a famous astro uh, astronomer, economist <laughs> from MIT uh, who wrote the construction of a model consists of snatching from the enormous and complex mass of facts called reality a few simple, easily managed key points, which when put together in some cunning way becomes for certain purposes a substitute for reality itself. So are we actually looking for a substitute for reality itself or are we looking for reality? We are not economists, I'm proud to say. We are scientists. We are looking to discover reality, not a substitute for reality. So if I look at, uh, Simon, this is a simulation of large-scale structure, <laughs> the Millennium Simulation. And this is a great success. This is what you know, shows great agreement with what we believe the universe looks like. Uh, but in order to have this simulation agree with observation, you have to include dark matter and you have to include dark energy. So are dark matter and dark energy and also inflation, are they reality or 21st century epicycles? <laughs> this is a simulation from a pre previous millennium. <laughs> and uh, so you can imagine this is you know, dark matter, dark energy, inflation. The, are these things you put in to get the model to work, or are they reality? We have to understand this. Just a side note, you know, these of course are epicycles, and they do not come from the work of Ptolemy. This is from De Revolutionibus of Copernicus, who had more epicycles in his model than Ptolemy ever dreamed of. So astronomy, in fact, is important. Understanding dark matter and dark energy is important for astronomy, it's important for cosmology, and it's also important for physics. So the idea that astronomy can serve physics is something that is, uh, is not new. We might say for dark energy, nothing more can be done by the theorist. That's sort of redundant, but in, in this matter, <laughs> it's only you, the astronomers, who can perform a simply invaluable service to theoretical physics. We might say this about dark energy and dark matter today, but in fact it was said a long time ago by Einstein, who in 1913 wrote a uh, Berlin astronomer Freundlich encouraging him to mount an expedition to measure the deflection of light by the sun. It would have been a great experiment if Freundlich had been able to do it successfully in 1914 he would have disproved Einstein's theory of relativity because at that time Einstein had not completely developed the theory, his prediction was off by a factor of two. And sort of a lesson, which maybe supports Simon's position for astronomers uh, when told by physicists go measure something accurately, is that uh, Freundlich tr attempted to do the observations in the Crimea right at the outbreak of the First World War, and unfortunately was in an extraordinary rendition he was arrested and imprisoned. So uh, may maybe that lesson is not so, uh, so good for astronomers. So in this introduction, uh, I tried to make a couple of points. One point is that it's, an, I believe, an artificial distinction to say some branches of science, some endeavors are fundamental and others are not. If you are working on planet formation, you you know, your fundamental particles are not quarks. And I think it's a, it's a bad uh, approach and it's not good for any science to say this science is fundamental and this science is not. We are all one science. And uh, the idea, we can look at the high energy physics community 
as a possible asymptotic state of astronomy, and we can choose to go there or not. Just because uh, ATLAS and the high energy physics communities have certain data release uh, procedures does not mean we need to adopt those. So I think there's a problem with high energy physics in not making their data public. And uh, probably most of the responses to the essay I wrote in response to Simon's essay came from high energy physicists either uh, telling me I was crazy to suggest that high energy physicists could share data or telling me it's about time somebody discussed this. So that, I think, is an issue with the high energy physics community. We can have large collaborations, we can study dark energy, and we can make the data public if it serves science and if we choose to do so. So the uh, ball is in our court, court. We are in charge of our future, and we should discuss these issues and decide how the community will be structured as astronomy changes. This is not, we're not going to have astronomy in the future being single investigators sitting in the prime focus cage of telescopes. It's going to be done with larger and larger collaborations. We have to come to grips and find a way to do this. So I think that was my 15 minutes, and uh, thank you for that. Thank you. Switch? Who's switching here? So uh, I was thinking of starting the last five minutes here by saying that Rocky and I had had a division that I was going to give the content and he was going to give the jokes. Because <laughs> I've been warned ahead of time you should never try to compete with Rocky for jokes. <laughs> but in fact, unfortunately, he had quite a bit of content and I have a different problem. <laughs> which actually is that I agree with it. So rebuttal, I think, is not particularly appropriate. But I do have some things which I think is worth spending about five minutes to say, which is come back to one of his things. So I think we agree that the issues are essentially sociological issues about how we should run our science. There is these opportunities. We have to take advantage of them. How do we want to do it? So one thing he said was that astronomy is changing. And I agree with that. And here's a graph from my paper which shows that. So this is uh, some publication statistics. This is from 1970. 2006, or maybe it was 75, this is 30 years of astronomy. And this is some statistics about how astronomy has changed. So if you ask how many refereed papers are there per year, there are 8,503 in uh, 1975. And that increased by just over a factor of two. So the number of papers has not gone up as much as you might have thought. How many people are writing those papers? You can count the number of authors. I was helped by the people at ADS to make this. You can count the number of authors to paper and how, how many people are actually publishing papers in the astronomical journals. That's this red curve. Uh, sorry, it's uh, this curve where, where I can't read that. That's 9,000. Oh, I can probably read here. Yes. 9,000 in 1970. It's gone up by a factor of four. So there are four times as many um, pa uh, people and only twice as many papers. So what are they all doing? Well, you can count how many <laughs> <laughs> you can count how many authors there are in each paper. And on average, in 1903, there were two authors per paper, and that's doubled. So actually, everybody gets the same number of papers on average with their name on as they did in 1903. So it's about the same. But if you ask how many citations they're getting, that's going really well because the reference lists have grown tremendously. So the red curve here is how many references. So the average paper only had nine references in uh, 1975, that's gone up by a factor of three. And there are fields where it's gone up by much larger factors than this. So, you know, you get a lot more citations even though you only put in half as much work and publish the same amount of papers. <laughs> so this has a, an effect on our field. And it's interesting that if you look at the top end of the field, you see uh, the, the things that are very highly cited. You see a difference in the sociology. So this, this you can see here. The Science Citation Index has been putting out pages since, 19, uh, since 2003 where they just look over the last 10 years and list the people who got the most citations to their papers in the last 10 years. 
and these are the people who did this. And if you look here, number 10 here was Sri Kulkarni. He had 161 papers in 10 years. I'm sure he wrote and read every single one of them. <laughs> and uh, and uh, those papers, well, compared to the people higher up the list, you know, I think it's a, it's a good bet. He got, he got 4,500 citations. Now, you can look just four years later, the last one here, it's the same period of time. Okay, actually, same person at the top. Now, the bottom person here is Masataka Fukugita, about the same number of papers, 11,000 citations. It's got by a factor of three for the same number of papers in the same year. So, even though it's a 10 year average, the citation rate's gone up by a factor of three. So, the way things are going are very different. The other thing, if you look here, you'll see almost all the people on this list are clearly there because they're a member of big collaborations. In fact, I think. Uh, seven of the ten are, the, are, are there. Most of the citations come from Sloan Digital Sky Survey papers. So what you see is that these citations have come from being parts of big collaborations and, uh, and, and being one on an author, not as long as the ones that Rocky showed, but still pretty long. So what you're going to learn from this is fairly soon it's going to be useless to use citations to try and assess people. So how are we going to see who did what? And I think this is the issue, and that's what Rocky was referring to with his long list with the AA Blacks and uh, various other people. <laughs> how are we going to assess how people are doing? In astronomy, you've looked at their papers. Often they'd be the first author, and you could read them and see if you thought they were good. If you have these big collaborations, you can't do that, because who knows who did what? So what can you do? You have to ask a senior person, do you think this is a good guy? Write a rough reference. So you're, you're, your judgments have to be based on what the more senior people in the collaboration will say somebody did. So now think, if you're a young person and you want to get on in life, what do you have to do? Do you have to publish independent papers, which people think are good, or do you have to make sure the person who's your superior in the collaboration thinks you're doing a good job? Now, I think this is, this is a real issue. How do we deal with it? And that's exactly the point that Rocky was making. So let me say, this is just a summary of what I thought the things that should be done. So this is what I said should be done I, th I thought was to try and address this. I think we should do dark energy. We should try to keep the advantages of our community. So what should we do to try and make sure that we, keep, we can do dark energy, but we still keep the strong points of the astronomical tradition? So I think we have to recognize, just as Rocky was saying, that there are differences in culture between astro and HE, and they're each good for some aspect of our science, and we have to exploit what each is strong for when we bring them together. And if you see some aspect of the other community which you think is not good, then you should push for your own. And this won't be easy because they're obviously the two sides have to do this together. So we'll see how, for example, DOE and NASA managed to finance the JDEM mission. This will be an interesting exercise in seeing if the two communities can work together. We have to design our instruments to address a wide range of issues. This is just you know, a sensible risk uh, spreading strategy. You don't want to, to design your instrument only to do dark energy. If there's a good chance you know, that you get an uninteresting answer, you want to make sure it can still do something else. I think we should prioritize where we spend our money, not just on the prime mission, but also on the broader impact of instruments. And this is very difficult when funding agencies want you to give an executive summary with three bullets of what your billion dollars are going to buy. It's hard to say this will be an observatory which will discover lots of interesting things. It's much better to say, this will solve the fundamental problem of the universe. And this actually is a significant issue, in my view. Then when you're actually running a large project, you have to do, as the Sloan survey did, you have to find ways to promote the secondary science, the smaller projects, the side projects, in order to give the younger people a chance to do something which they can clearly say is their own, so they can have their paper where we know they did the work. And when you get these big collaborations, I think we have to find some way that we can assign credit for things that happen based on the intellectual contribution of the people. Because if young, ambitious, and bright people are going to want to come into astronomy, they're going to want to feel that they can get credit for their own intellectual contributions. And so there has to be a mechanism for recognizing it. And so I think we should make sure, as astronomers, now speaking as an astronomer, that if we do dark energy, that in the process of doing dark energy, we also enhance creativity in astrophysics. So that's what I want to say. Well, on that, on that last point, 
if we do dark energy, we have to do it in the right way to, to uh, enhance creativity in astrophysics. We are in complete agreement. And uh, finally, Simon agrees with me. Thank, thank, thank you, Simon. <laughs> so let me, uh, let me just, in, in this couple of minutes, just say a couple of things. Uh, one is uh, Simon ma makes a, a big distinction between Hubble Space Telescope being a general observatory and uh, other uh, more targeted projects. And that's true. That's the way it's developed. Uh, but I, 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 of course, am too young to remember. But looking back into history of when HST was started, I don't believe it was sold to uh, Congress or to the administration as, as an observatory that's going to be up there for 25 years doing all sorts of interesting wide range of, uh, of astrophysics and astronomy. It was sold on the basis of key projects. And if you would have, I believe, gone to Washington in 1980, whatever, and uh, asked uh, our representatives and people at NASA, what is uh, Hubble going to do, Hubble Space Telescope, they say it's going to measure the Hubble constant and maybe a couple of other things. So I think that distinction is uh, maybe a little bit misleading, because if there is a dark energy mission that JDAM, JDAM that NASA and DOE put up, Again, it's being, uh, I guess the technical word is marketed as something to do dark energy, but who knows what will come out of it. You can imagine a gigapixel camera in space, and if it's done right, a remarkable amount of science will come out of that that's not just dark energy. And I think we agree that's what we want to do, that if it's managed correctly, that will happen. And in terms of um, whether dark energy observations are uh, a realistic thing to do, an important thing to do. I mean, we may only gain a factor of three in knowledge of some parameter. Uh, I take the point of view that we have very talented astronomers and astrophysicists willing to devote their lives to work on this. And uh, you know, I, I like the idea of really smart people voting with their feet and deciding what they want to do. Now, it could be that they are all naive or have been brainwashed, but somehow I don't think so. So I think that they, you know, they're voting with their feet. They're deciding what to do. They must think it's a possibility for uh, a real advance in knowledge. And in fact, a factor of two or three could be absolutely crucial. In, um, I, I'm too young to remember, but in 1608, when Galileo first turned his optic tube toward the sky before he wrote uh, Sidereus Nuncius, his optic tube increased his vision by about a factor of two or three. And you know, people might, if he had gone to uh, uh, the government and said, you know, I'm going to build this, it's going to increase my vision by a factor of two or three, they said, a factor two or three, what are you going to see? Right? You know. Of course, he revolutionized astronomy for that. And a factor of two or three sometimes can uh, really change the world. So that's uh, what I have to say. And again, thanks, everybody. And let's, uh, let's come up here and hear from the community. OK, questions? Okay, could everybody at the back hear the question? Yes? So my response to that is I don't do astronomy for money. <laughs> and I don't think more money will actually mean we do better astronomy. So I, I don't think that uh, evidence has any force. If the mission is no good, no matter how much money you spend on it, you'll end up wasting your time. Oh, but let me, let, let, me, let me say that I, I don't want to say that the missions are no good, but if they were no good, <laughs> then you would waste your time. <laughs> Well, along those lines, you know, it's um, for 23 years I worked at Fermilab, and I heard a lot from the other side that astronomy is coming in and polluting high energy physics, and that's that's the big danger. So maybe this is a real sign of health and balance in the field. Go ahead. Would you stand up? Yeah. 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 Y
stand up so every, yeah. and everyone can hear you. And a cute. that directed to okay so um, I, I think it's a real danger uh, of course in collider experiments there are more than one collider at LEP there was four at Fermilab there's two at uh, detector at CERN there will also be two and uh, having so many eyes on the data I don't think I, I don't worry so much about the results being terribly wrong my real concern, and I think it's a problem with high energy physics not making the data public, is that I don't believe it, ma it maximizes the potential science output. And I think all of our discussion should not be based upon sociology, well, I built the detector, I own the data, uh, but rather what data release pr um, project or proposal you have will maximize the science output not of just the people who built it, but of the community as a whole. And I don't think high energy physics maximizes their science output by their data, their exclusive data rights. And a lot of people argue with me about that, oh, high energy physics is so complicated, you know, someone on the outside can't get it right. I don't think they make the effort. And I think they really should, not because it's fair, or not because it's the right thing to do, but because I think it will lead to more and better science. would see what was written. The problem with the current system is it only goes from the few leaders in the collaboration and they go in letters that most of the collaboration don't see. So if you did this generally, at least the whole collaboration would see what was said and they could judge whether they thought it was fair or not. So in that point of view, I think it would be a step forward. No, I think, I mean, unlike Rocky, uh, you know, who's uh, much younger than I am, of course, I was around at the time when uh, the HST was being put through Congress and even participated in some parts of the, of the key proposal uh, science. I think key proposals do play a critical role because they give you design goals. You have to have concrete projects when you're going to make an instrument to design how you should build it. If you know when you want to look at a certain kind of object, you want to see galaxies at redshift 3, you have to have good photometry to some magnitude limit, you need to have specific goals. And so the key projects 
are, have, are there essentially as examples of science that you would like to do, which help you design your instrument. But the philosophy behind it is you design a capability of the instrument, so you push the instrument to achieve these capabilities. It's a little different from an experiment where a large part of the, of the design is excluding things which would, which would perturb your primary, uh, your primary measurement that you're attempting to make to get rid of the side effects. Well, that, that's an important thing, and this is why we should have discussions like this, and people should be aware of it. And, of course, we shouldn't adopt any other field, just com you know, completely, but we can adopt their best practices. And of, in high-energy physics, which I have some famili familiarity with, uh, it's, in some places it's done well, some universities, some universities, they don't do it well. But it can be done well. You can be a graduate student coming in, again, let me turn to a Fermilab experiment because that's the one I know most about, to CDF, looking at data that was taken in run one, actually doing the shifts, taking data in run two, building, uh, you know, upgrades of detectors and things like that for some previous things. So the graduate student can have a broad range of experiences. And also within large collaborations, there are small working groups and small components of detectors that are built that in fact are like an experiment onto themselves. There's different analysis groups that run things. So it's really like, uh, you know, little communities within this large collaboration. It's not that 440 people do one 440th of every task, right? And it, it's, it can work and we just have to be aware and adopt their best practices, not, not the things that don't work, not the things that they don't do well. The problem that I see with this is I, I agree this is a way that the graduate students can make a, a visible contribution and get a broad range of experience. What I don't see in this system is the opportunity for them to make their, an individual creative intellectual contribution which can be recognized. I mean, I was here as a graduate student in Toronto and in, in the year I was here, I was able to have a project, write a paper. And by the time I'd finished my thesis, I had several papers where I had basically thought of the project and worked it out and published it. And in the kind of work you're doing, I think publishing a creative idea is very difficult in this context. So I think this is an important part of learning to do research in astronomy. And I think this is very hard to promote inside large collaborations. And I think the only way to do it is in the way it was done inside the Sloan survey, whereas you're taking data, you find side projects you can do with the data which still have significant scientific value. And many, many astronomical surveys, this is possible, so I think this should be fostered. I agree. <laughs> I actually disagree. I think if you think money is the issue, then you're in the wrong field. Yeah, that's... <laughs>
the goal is to, I mean, the, the goal is to advance science, and citations are a valid reflection of that, but it's not the end all and be all, right? You know, how is science best advanced? with that and I think it, therefore if you want to do this it's important that some part of the mission should actually be able to point this telescope where you want to you know, because most of the missions that's actually not part of the plan but but uh, eventually again my point is we are in charge of this right it's our community we can make the right decisions or not and we should have these discussions and come to the right decisions Stand up, please. Oh, okay. Fair. Um, <laughs> on the seeming to claim that money is not a central issue. I mean, it seems that most scientific fields, uh, things are very specialized. Every biology experiment, every planetary science mission. So specialization as opposed to multi-purpose uh, things only becomes an issue because there's a finite budget and each individual thing you want to do is getting more. No, I mean, money is necessary. It's necessary for high energy physics and it's necessary for astronomy because we need very expensive equipment. But I think, you know, I'm ag essentially agreeing with Rocky. I think the priority is you have to judge what science you want to do overall and then you figure out how to spend your money. Just to go and say, if we do this science, we will get more money, I think you can spend a lot of your time. I mean, who thinks that Gravity Pro B was a good, spend, uh, was a good expenditure of NASA money? You know, you put a lot of effort in. If you're not careful, you get tracked down something where you spend a lot of time, a lot of very smart people spend a lot of time on things which a lot of the community would think was of little worth. So we don't want to get in that road. Simon, I mostly agree with you, but, uh, you know, the phrase spend your money on, it's not your money, at, at least not in the, so you, you come from a managed economy in Germany from a, <laughs> from, a, a rich, uh, private, Max Planck, Uncle Max takes care of you. But, but uh, in the U.S., and uh, I, I think in Canada also, it's not your money. You know, you have to fight and scratch. And it's not that you're guaranteed a certain budget and you decide how to do it. So th th there is a distinction. For the questions. I don't think you're correct. I mean, we just bought a single station for a low-frequency radio telescope in Garching, which is one of a hundred stations in Europe. That's transferring data back to the, to the central agency at, at, at eight uh, gigabits per second. And all of them are doing this, and that's all coming in. That's not as much smaller data rate than you're talking about. 
The data rates are quite comparable, and we will make those maps public. I, I hate, to disagree, uh, hate to agree with Simon, but, uh, <laughs> but I, actually I, and I, I disagree with you that I think high energy physics could make their data public, they just don't try to. So the data rates envisioned for ATLAS, that's being written to tape, is very comparable, in fact smaller than the data rates anticipated for LSST, which is you know, coming on a few years later, computers will be better. So it's, you, know, you might say that's not a fair comparison, but it's just not in the high energy physics culture. And this is uh, a cultural issue. I think high energy physics could release their data. Neutrino physics experiments do not release their data. And they're not flooded with events, right? <laughs> So I think the, I mean, we both agree that dark energy is, a, is an enormous puddle, puzzle, um, probably involves new physics, and we, neither of us or anybody else apparently has much of a clue what this physics will turn out to be, and there are a lot of different suggestions. So the question you have to have, there's only very few things we can measure, and we can only improve the current error bars by a relatively small factor, maybe a factor of 10 if everything goes right, maybe a factor of 3 if we're less lucky. So it's a, a question, it's just a betting issue. You know, amongst all these possible explanations, none of which we really believe or, or understand very well, whether we will actually find out something with this factor of three or not. And as Rocky says, you know, if we're lucky, we could find out everything. If we're unlucky, we're still in the same, same position after the mission's finished. We just don't know. So it's a, as I say, it's a question of how, whether you should, of spreading the risk. You can spend a lot of money. If it doesn't work out and we're unlucky, then you should do something else as well. So let me elaborate on that a little bit, because this is something uh, Simon, Simon uh, alluded to the fact that uh, I was on the Dark Energy Task Force. And we met for a year, and we struggled with the idea of saying, if you improve by a factor of 2, 3, 5, 10, then you can stop there. You will know whether it's this, that, or the other. And we couldn't. So the question comes up, when do you stop? You know, so after you do this round of missions, improving the error bars, do you do another round and another round and another round? And of course, this isn't in our report, but the consensus of the task force was that you stop doing it when really talented people stop having good ideas and are willing to devote their life and work to doing it. And I like the idea of uh, astronomers voting with their feet. If the really good astronomers want to study dark energy, then they should be, be able to. A, a supersymmetric partner or whatever, you know, the guy at the top will get the Nobel Prize, and you know, You're there are too many people even, yeah, but, but you won't, there, there are so many people they won't even get invited to the party. <laughs> Group hug. <laughs> okay. Um, this was billed as a debate and it started out as something that was going to be confrontational, but as the discussion goes on, I see more and more commonalities, and I don't know whether to feel gypped or not. <laughs>
profoundly disagree or substantially disagree. That's fair enough. <laughs> I, I think Rocky should disagree on that point. <laughs> So um, I disagree with the idea of saying there's fundamental science and there's not fundamental science. To me, all science is fundamental. I, I view it more as a, as a fuzzy, holistic uh, thing rather than having, you know, this is astronomy, this is physics. I think we're, we're basically all scientists, except string theorists. <laughs> no, that, so actually, so, so, some of my best friends talk to string theorists. Uh, <laughs> and in terms of whether uh, you know, dark energy is good or bad for astronomy, I, I, think, it's, I, I think it's the wrong question. And the, a better question to ask is, uh, when we do dark energy, how do we do it right? How do we do it the right way? So I, I try to frame it in terms of a different, uh, a different question. So maybe we disagree on that point. Well, I think it's really an issue of spin. I think we differ in the spin. I don't think we actually differ significantly in the content. And you know, Rocky is right to pick on this thing which I put about fundamentalist physics and dark energy being bad from astro astronomy. The reason for that was not that I think any physical property can be bad or good for astronomy. But I think it's important to have a debate about the sociological issues that are arising from this coming together of two very different fields with very different traditions. And to get a debate going, you have to get people riled up. And you can't get people riled up with some namby-pamby Canadian kind of <laughs> statement. <laughs> so I, that's why I picked the title. <laughs> That's a, probably a suitable note to end upon. <laughs> so let's do that. So thank you all very much for, uh, for coming.